Hi y'all, it's Martha Roberts here. This month I'm bringing you tips and tidbits about some fun and fabulous urgent care issues. The format of these particular online audio lectures will follow a similar format to my monthly online column. This column is written with supplemental videos and photographs that are designed for emergency medicine news online and are strictly procedures based. It's called the procedural pause. When my good old dad is not lecturing me about how to save for retirement, which by the way, I'm still not doing, he contributes to our online project. The dude, Dr. Jim Roberts, stars in a few videos as well as adds a few clinical pearls to the topics as well. I urge you to check these videos and these articles out. At any time you have any questions or would like to see the videos or photographs we're referring to in any audio segment, log on to EM News Online and take a look at the procedural pause. A large majority of the material that I plan to present in this audio blog will be procedural based and in like a what we call five and five like format, meaning we'll talk about five things in about five minutes related to a procedure or even run through a short mini series on related topics or cases. Anytime you have requests or feedback, please feel free to contact me at georgetownnp at gmail.com. <laughs> One of our very first procedural pause topics discussed our fascination with finger complaints and hand procedures. It's pretty clear that we take our 10 fingers for granted because when one of those buddies is not working right, it's totally, it screws everything up. Seriously, it just, it's so annoying. You can't type, you can't throw a ball, you can't write normally with a pen, you can't poke your older brother, you can't pick your nose with that particular finger anymore. And you really, you can't believe how even the tiniest of injuries can hurt, like really bad. Yeah, they, they, they really hurt. I have been lucky enough to work with a really stellar hand surgeon, Dr. Vinny Meehan here in Virginia. He's taught myself and many of my colleagues quite a bit about care for complex hand issues. I thought I would start off simple by discussing something you can totally handle yourself. Yes. The Paranychia. Such a cute little name for such an annoying little <laughs> issue. For those of you who are not familiar with this nefarious Paranychia, I will briefly tell you a bit about what they look like, what the correct procedure is for treating them, and how patients can be the best advocates for feeling them at home without antibiotics or a bunch of really expensive non-clinically indicated medications. One of my biggest issues with urgent and emergency care is what I like to call unnecessary roughness we put our patients through both physically, financially, and mentally. I learned from the great Jerry Hoffman that we are first and fundamentally to care for our patients, to give care and be a caring individual. I feel like if you keep that point in mind, you simply cannot fail. So whether you are in urgent care, a level one trauma center, really doesn't matter. People are still going to come to the ER for paranychia. Embrace the fact that this is an emergency to them and then learn how to treat it right away so you can pop them out the door. Nicely, of course. So number one, identify the problem. The paranychia, what is it? A paranychia is an infection of the soft tissue around the fingernail. It's either in the hand or the toe. That typically starts more like a redness or a cellulitis and oftentimes progresses to form an abscess, which can either turn white or green. The infection is typically a staph infection. Oftentimes it's polymicrobial, sometimes it's MRSA, but other times it can be caused by a fungal infection. The worst type of complication from a paranychia would be the formation of what is called a felon, which is a significant pus formation under the tuft of the finger and around the nail. There are almost always a need to have these surgically drained, so these require close follow-up. If you have a simple paranychia show up in house that does not look that angry, there are some simple tricks that you can try. By the time this patient arrives to see you in the ED, most likely they need the paranychia poked. Paranychia are typically swollen, warm, tender, erythematous, and sometimes, like I said, you can see that small amount of pus leaking around the nail base. Patients may also state that they notice some drainage and they almost always report some kind of hangnail, hand trauma, possible foreign body, like a splinter or a sliver. 
recent nail salon visit, or prior history of the same. Once you have identified the problem, you can move on to step number two. What do I do with the paronychia? Well, you're going to poke it. Yes, my friends, you're just going to go for it. You're going to stab it with a blunt needle and make it disappear. It really is as simple and easy as that, but I'm going to offer some tips. Plus, don't tell your patients that's what's going to happen. Maybe you could lighten the mood a bit. I don't know. Soft music, dim the lights, you know, don't show them the needle, that kind of thing. Which brings me to number three. What do you do when these patients come in and they have chronic complaints? So chronic complaints happen a lot, especially at urgent care centers where essentially you are the primary care provider for a lot of these people. What do we do when patients continue to get these things on a regular basis? Well, let's say the same patient keeps returning for chronic paronychia. In the past, you may have considered antifungal treatments or gram staining and culture versus a KOH 5% smear for candida infection to determine the cause. And we're going to talk a little more about candida infection in just a minute. What you don't want to miss is the diagnosis of herpetic whitlow, retained foreign body that you didn't get the first time, a malignancy, or as already mentioned, this felon, which is going to need surgical management, and a phone call to your hand specialist or plastic surgeon. Do not miss osteolitis if the patient looks clinically sick and the wound is very infected. Occasionally, these patients get a tendinitis or tenosynovitis, so that should also be considered and evaluated for if suspected. But once you poke this thing, it really should be one and done. I came across this great little 2002 Italian study by Tosti et al. in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. Now, the background here is that they stated that the involvement of candida and the pathogenesis of a chronic paronychia has never been proven, even though this condition is commonly considered. Basically, what they did was compare the efficacy of the systemic antifungals with a topical corticosteroid in the treatment of patients with chronic paronychia. The study involved 45 adult patients with chronic paronychia. It's an okay sample size. Medication was given in a randomized, double-blind, and double-dummy manner over three weeks. Patients were then followed for six weeks. Clinical and mycologic evaluations were performed at baseline, then at weeks three, and then week nine. The efficacy measures included a clinical and a photographic evaluation, so they were really complete. Of the 45 nails treated with topical corticosteroids, 41 were improved or cured at the end of the follow-up period. That is almost all of them. The statistical analysis showed a significant difference between the number of nails improved or cured by steroids and that of the nails improved or cured with any kind of antifungal. The presence of candida was not strictly linked to the disease activity, and candida eradication was associated with clinical cure in only two of the 18 patients who carried candida at the beginning of the study. So the bottom line, this study shows that topical steroids are more effective than systemic antifungals in the treatment of chronic paronychia. And it supports the view that chronic paronychia is not a fungal infection, but a variety of hand dermatitis caused by environmental exposures instead. Fungus, we are not blaming you this time, but we might in the future. This is yet another reason why I love steroids. I love them. I love them. Number four, sorting through the data. There seems to be quite a bit of information and up-to-date as well as other online sources for management of paronychia. The most important thing to do in a mild or moderate case with paronychia is warm soaks daily about five to ten times a day. Typically, I tell patients that require specific instructions for cases like this to do the soaks twice as much than what is actually required because I feel like they never adequately soak their finger enough to get these things to drain. The same idea sort of applies to common exercises to avoid frozen shoulder, warm compresses to styes, and icing injuries, etc. If you want people to soak their finger four times a day for three days, you tell them eight times a day instead. The warm soaks may resolve the paronychia on its own in less than three to five days. As far as antibiotics are concerned, in a healthy, young, individual, or otherwise compliant patient, none are really needed. But again, the data is quite limited, and we'll discuss that in just a few short moments here. Patients with extensive surrounding cellulitis or diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, or who are immunocompromised for any reason, may benefit from a short course of antibiotics, in which case I would do something like Keflex, 500 milligrams PO, four times a day for three to five days. 
Basically, any anti-staphylococcal penicillin or first-generation cephalosporin or augmentin are generally effective. Other considerations for those who might be panallergic might be clindamycin. If a large abscess has developed, drainage must be performed in-house, and then the patient can continue with the warm soaks and dressing changes at home for the next five days. It's a good idea to apply a topical antibacterial ointment and a bulky dressing post-poking. Tell the patient to remove it tomorrow and continue the soaks in the morning. Consider a topical triple antibiotic ointment over-the-counter brands are fine, topically two or three times a day. This will also prevent the dressing from sticking to the wound. Finally, number five. The best part of this run-of-the-mill nail infection is poking these little suckers. Poke, 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 poke. What is more satisfying than draining a pus-filled perinechium? Everybody loves a good abscess. Seeing the look of relief on the face of your patient when his painful pulsating digit is relieved of all that tension, oof, gives me chills. Okay, no, not really. That would be weird. This rather elementary procedure could be perceived as stale and uneventful for some of you, but the more thorough and astute clinicians, however, realize these tiny infections around the nail root may open the door to a mixed bag of insidious and harmful bacterial infections, including MRSA, chronic reoccurrences, cellulitis, subungal abscesses, osteomyelitis, herpetic whitlow, or even the dreaded felon, as we already mentioned. Whatever your pleasure, this routine procedure requires a quick and steady hand, literally, and a caring, thoughtful provider. It is important not only to provide immediate and proper pain relief through possible digital nerve block, might need to be done, but also prevent a bounce back patient who did not understand the discharge instructions. You may have a fiery passion for perinechia, or you may not, but the procedure is truly appreciated by pediatric and adult patients alike. Be sure to check out the online material on the procedural pause and the videos and the how-tos. We have some great pictures of perinechia as well. We discuss more draining techniques, appropriate doses and courses of antibiotics if you choose to use them, as well as key tips and pearls such as remembering to get the patient soaking in the warm water bath in the waiting room so they can start to drain these perinechias on their own. Contrary to popular belief, nail, skin, cutting, or removal is rarely indicated for most perinechia, so please don't do that. It is really not the greatest choice. It can delay healing, so avoid it. Just a few uh, things that we want to review um, that we discussed is that one, again, you want to start having your patient soak early upon presentation to the ED and you might see a significant improvement within 20 minutes. Antibiotic use is subject to presentation. Be sure to cover for staphylococcus. Consider gram-negative anaerobes in young children with those who have frequent nail biting. Also, as mentioned, consider viral causes, including herpes simplex virus, which causes herpetic whitlow. Always check for a felon or cellulitis. Suspect osteomyelitis. Nine out of 10 times when pus is present, you will have to drain them with the help of a small needle stick and evacuation. High-risk jobs associated with perinechia include nail technicians, dishwashers, shops, and meat packers. Of note, there are very few studies about oral antibiotics for the treatment of perinechia versus simple IND. There is a 2012 article, however, by Ridding, O'Malley, and Rodner in the Journal of Hand Surgery, which asked the question, what is the preferred method of treatment for an acute perinechial infection? Bottom line, there is none. They did a comprehensive 30-year literature review showing absolutely no evidence for the superiority of either oral antibiotics or incision and drainage for acute perinechia. The authors also mentioned that specifically in the last six years, there really hasn't been much new information about perinechia at all, especially regarding the treatments. So it appears that we need to start writing more about these guys. They did agree that the most common infecting organism of the perinechia is staph, and then followed closely by strep and sometimes pseudomonas. Common initial conservative treatment measures were suggested before abscess formation usually involve the use of worm water soaks three to four times a day with the addition of any anti-staphylococcal antibiotic. There are no studies that specifically look at the efficacy of warm soaks, but from firsthand treatment, I have found that these patients get better when you stick their finger in warm water. I've seen them evolve over time and they often report significant relief. They also talked about 20 patients in this study with perinechia who received topical gentamicin antibiotic alone, 
which proves superior for pain control versus a triple antibiotic ointment. The topical gentamicin antibiotic showed a rapid 50% decline in pain scores reported on day 3.5 as comparatively to those who were using the triple antibiotic ointment who did not have pain relief until day 5. So I mean two days, that's a big deal to patients who can't use their fingers because of pain. The authors of this paper also mentioned oral Keflex, clindamycin, augmentin. Those all covered the wildest and widest spectrum of paronychia bugs. But then again, there are really no clinically comparative trials to support these medications either. In the end, we still feel IND is the best way to rid the body of any abscess, large or small. So I say keep popping pimples, uh, poking paronychia, and squeezing gluteal pus typically need to be laid out on the stretcher if you poke that paronychia because they almost always have a vasovagal syncope. My buddy, Dr. Eugene Lee from Inova Fairfax Hospital prefers to lie pretty much all of his patients down that are getting any kind of procedure. He puts them supine, unless of course it's contraindicated, and that's how he prevents any of these young guys from passing out on the floor and getting, you know, like a head injury. Not only does it make it more comfortable for the patient, but, you know, then he doesn't have to worry about any sudden syncope or any other issues. There are so many sacred cows out there. We are still blindly worshipping them. And I hope these audio series will open a discussion about evidence-based care or lack thereof and how we can reference it or contribute to finding more data on a daily basis in our jobs in the urgent care and emergency care setting. Then maybe we could all think about the procedures we do and how we do them a bit better so our patients feel better. Until next time, that was the 5 and 5. Email me with your questions at georgetownnp at gmail.com.